there's this documentary from the channel Noclip, and it's a fantastic channel where they meet up with developers and do interviews and background like retrospectives on various games. And they did a documentary on Forgotten City, and it turns out that this whole game started as a Skyrim mod. This was the first development effort by this guy named Nick Pierce. He made this mod in Skyrim as kind of just an experiment to like test out how do you develop something, you know, how do you make a world. So he made a little underground dungeon in Skyrim and then it was a very small space because of course again he's just starting out. And within this small space he had the creative idea of what if you're just toying with the parameters within this space. So then you're, instead of making something bigger and bigger by expanding outward, it's bigger and bigger inward in terms of like changing what you know about this space. And that's how he started out. One of the amazing details in the documentary was that this guy started out, he was a lawyer, never done development before. And at one point, one of his co-workers or his boss showed him an article about that mod because that mod became really popular. And so the boss shows him this article and says, is this you? And the developer's like, yeah, yeah, that's me. And then the boss says, look, either you commit to being a lawyer or you're not going to make it. Sort of like this ultimatum. And so this guy actually made that big life choice. He was a successful lawyer. And he decided to quit being a lawyer and devote himself full time to actually turning in this mod into a full fledged game. According to the Noclip doc, he ended up using up a good majority of his life savings, committing himself to this idea. This is something where this person almost gave up his whole career for this. Now that I know that it was this passion project, it explains a lot. The game feels like it was made by someone who really wanted to make something unique. It would be easy to say that the looping mechanic, for example, the way that the characters goes through the same day over and over would be like a roguelike mechanic, but it's not really that, right? This, this guy seems like he came in with the story idea first and then built a game around that. I think the story is where it really shines and the dialogue and the writing. It's super clever all the way through. Right when I first started playing it and you first sort of discover the mystery of it, I was instantly hooked. You can tell that this developer has the spirit of a writer. It kind of fits that he was a lawyer too because it's also someone who is intrigued by character and story but also the logic of arguments and the ways in which things don't always have easy answers or conundrums don't always have easy answers and so this game is almost exclusively dialogue we enter into this world and it's a world in the past which might as well be alien to us and we're slowly discovering the stories of the characters within this space and we're discovering the problems that they're dealing with and through dialogue and our decision making we're figuring out how best to help them which in turn potentially helps ourselves you're this modern man who washes up on shore literally right i guess you you somehow wake up next to a river and there is this woman saying that someone else had already gone ahead of you that she just found you and she would really like you to help find this other guy named al and she says oh this guy went into these roman ruins and please you know help me out and so you go and you follow him and it turns out that within these ruins is some kind of teleportation thing, this portal, that teleports you back into the past, into a Roman city thousands of years ago. You get transported into the past and in so doing you find out that the city is stuck in a kind of loop, not in the same loop that you're in, because you actually, your ability to loop day after day is unique to you. In this city, everyone is stuck following the golden rule. And it's a bit of a play on words because you know we all know the golden rule in the generic sense which is the rule that do unto others as you would have them do unto you and in this world the golden rule is the sins of the one become the sins of the many if any one person does something wrong everyone else is punished and the punishment to explain the play on words for golden rule is that everyone gets turned into gold and that's the premise when you're first thrust into this space, you are just like the main character in that you are a modern person being placed into the past and you now need to understand this space and these people. And you're not just understanding their problems in terms of the overarching golden rule conundrum that they're in, you're also just trying to understand their cultural differences. And then you meet Sentius, the magistrate, the ruler over this town, the person who ends up being like your first main quest giver. Once you meet the magistrate of the town, Sentius, he sort of gives you the rundown of what he needs you to do for all of these people. He needs you to prevent everybody's death by preventing a single act of sinfulness. He needs you to sort of become the detective of the town, not to figure out if a crime has occurred, but if a crime will occur. You need to learn what people's motivations are, and you need to learn the ways in which people can bend the rules just long enough that they can think that they've gotten away with sinning. 
And Sentius presumes that you would be good for this precisely because you're new. I guess people would open up to you in a way that's a little bit different. So you're a detective from the outset. This is one of the most classically detective style games I've played in a really long time. Because it doesn't hold your hand too much. It actually does give you like quest markers and things. It gives you ways to keep track of a lot of the ideas. But you need to treat the information you're receiving as a tool set that you're then going to utilize in various different spaces and places going forward in the future. So that's the outset. That's the whole thing, right? This is like the, the bake that's setting you up for everything that's to follow and like getting you in the primed for this world. The gameplay is just dialogue. Each loop gives you more information that ends up being your greatest treasure. Like just the knowledge that you have allows you to have completely new dialogue options with people. After every loop, I want to talk to everybody again, just in case some of my knowledge is going to lead to a completely different kind of conversation. And oftentimes it did. There's so much depth that you can find in each conversation. I did think that it was, frankly, a game that didn't need any other aspects to it, though it did. It did have the short section of platforming and action that is optional anyway. Even without that, I think the game is just really thrilling because there's always something new to talk about with this very small cast of characters. I found myself almost completely ignoring the main goal very soon after I started talking to people. There is a generic question that you can ask every person you meet, and that is, what is your story? Every one of those was interesting. I found myself really liking these people and finding the troubles of just their lives in this space to be interesting in and of itself, removed from the ultimate aim that I otherwise had. I sort of went about it treating these people as an end in themselves as opposed to a means mm -hmm. to an end. Mm -hmm. Very Kantian in that way. The problem that they're facing is one of a very systematic rule-based society in which the rules are highly stringent and stuck and yet it doesn't account for some of the adaptations that people can make around those rules. In this golden rule there is this overarching sin that you're supposed to avoid but sin isn't clearly defined for the populace. So the magistrate Sentius has this view, okay, well, since sin isn't clearly defined, I'm just going to follow the empire's rules to the T, whatever else, that's it. The population themselves have different views on this. And so when you're talking to people, like you're dealing with them, trying to make their way in the world, feeling like they're probably more restricted than they should be. And there are those clever enough to get around the restrictions and prosper in a way that the ones who are really trying to do well can't. It's a really great conundrum for these people to be stuck in because you really are dealing with people suffering under a rule that's perhaps too strong for its own good. Well, their choices are really limited and, and they're limited in such a dangerous and threatening way. Anything that these people are wanting to commit is so much less horrifying than the punishment itself. Early on, there's a guy with a bow who appears right at the entrance to the bath. He makes demands of you and he says, you know, if you don't tell me the truth, I will, I will shoot you with this bow. And then the moment he tries to, the entire city erupts with a voice from the sky. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. It completely like raised the stakes, right? More than just like this guy with a bow. These people are terrified. They know that any amount of moral questioning itself is going to result in a higher risk of everybody dying. Even the questions, even the curiosity about ethics is stifled by this rule. The more thinking you do, the more riskier you become. The people around you are your greatest danger. The citizens in this town, based on talking to them, they don't seem inclined to do anything wrong. But they're so afraid about others doing something wrong and them being hurt by it that it kind of creates like a stultifying effect. They're, they're all in a prison and it's a utopian prison in the sense that technically there's peace here. But of course the peace is built on the sacrifice of free thought and agency. You don't really have much freedom if the very definition of freedom is counter to survival. And then it gets worse than that because as you talk to people more and more, you will find that there are some people who thrive in this society and it is not the most moral who thrive. This touches on a concept called the multi-person dilemma. And it's the idea that when you create a rigid enough moral system, the bad actors can take advantage the most. For example, if you have fishermen all agreeing to fish less in the ocean, then the one who wants to have more fish has easier access to more fish precisely because everyone else is following the rules. 
or if everyone drives less, the person who wants to drive more now has more road to drive upon, precisely because everyone else drove less. And so in this game, you'll find all sorts of weird things that appear like sins, but are technically following the rules, mm -hmm. simply because, for one, the people in the society aren't actually equipped to deal with sin when sin is outlawed. And so the ones who can connive their way around it actually have an easier time tricking people and ruining their lives. Even any sort of retaliation or any kind of consequences for those actions is outlawed itself. So there's no way to even resist their actions. It gives them so much leeway to make up their own rules as long as they follow the larger rule. You're forced to suffer silently because your retaliation precisely because it is explicit retaliation as opposed to some undercurrent of manipulation is punished. Whereas the one who manipulated cleverly while technically following the rules, that person is not punished. One of the first characters you meet when you first walk up and you turn to the left when you first enter the town, there's this lady out front. There's another woman inside of the temple that she's in front of. This lady is like a, a doctor and she's saying like, please help us. This lady is poisoned and I don't know how she was poisoned. Eventually you can find the remedy to stop the poison and you learn that she had drunk hemlock, which you would presume means because she wanted to kill herself. But it turns out that she was actually conned into this situation. She really wanted to get out of this town. And so she asked someone, hey, do you have a way out? And they said, yeah, I do have a way out, but it's going to cost you a thousand coins. And she didn't have a thousand coins. So she went to the richest person in the town and asked, can I borrow a thousand coins? He let her borrow it, but he said only contingent on you being willing to work for me for the next 30 years. She thought that's not a big deal because I'm using this money in order to get out of here. She pays the person who had told her that they have a way out. It turns out that it was just poison. It's just hemlock. And then she finds out afterward that the person selling the hemlock and the person she had gotten the loan from were in cahoots with one another. None of this is sinful for them to have essentially blackmailed her into the situation of becoming a slave because technically everything was literally outright stated. Hemlock is a way out in the sense of if you commit suicide, yes, that's a way out. She's forced to live out 30 years of servitude for this mistake. That's one of the first conundrums you see is just someone who just through a play on words is stuck in this horrible outcome and none of that is halted by this golden rule sin. There's immediately an irony built up. I don't think the game is trying to say that this town runs on a perfect objective moral system. There's systems in place and they function more or less dependent on whatever standard you apply in any one case. It works for a certain set of the population and not for another. There are many victims of those kinds of plays on words. The town has early and often many examples of people being hurt by other people in ways that are perfectly acceptable under the system. There's this guy who is, he's the only one who people know at least has an interest in same-sex relationship, but he doesn't engage in it because they also think that might be a sin that would cause everybody to die. Just one character finding out that he has this leaning results in him putting graffiti up and putting up threatening messages to him so that he knows that he should never engage in this act. One of the examples of how this system obviously prevents these sort of fast and spontaneous acts of harm like stealing or physical force, but it, it allows for the slower, less spontaneous, the slower, more routine acts of harm. The ones that you can do every day to a person and get away with. It makes the person doing the harm feel justified. So the guy who's leaving the graffiti constantly reminding the homosexual character like, hey, you're a bad person. You, you're going to be our downfall if you give in to your temptation. He's making this person feel scared, making this person feel belittled. All of that is justified in the mind of the person leaving the writing because within this moral code, there is a clear delineation between the guilty and the innocent. And the person leaving the message feels innocent because the other person is within that moral code potentially guilty. Once that language is used, now there is a gap. And once that gap is there, it becomes a justification to do almost anything to this person. All of these concepts don't get delved into extremely deeply in the game, but they are touched on. The ways in which there is a potentially corrupting influence in moral language and the ways that right and wrong is merely a means to separate and that once that separation occurs, all sorts of harmful, hateful things can then be justified. Like most things, right and wrong, especially when it's not actually clearly stated in the world in the game and in our real world, we're always butting heads with what is truly right and wrong.
wrong, and the fact that there is disagreement then leads to it being a language game of right and wrong, and really a language game of innocent and guilt. One of the saddest characters in this world that you meet is this guy Dooley. Based on the way that he speaks about things, he's mentally challenged in some way. He has a handicap. He's put in prison because he's always speaking of treasures and shiny things. And the magistrate feels, well, this person clearly doesn't understand the rules of our world or isn't capable of understanding the rules, therefore is bound to do something wrong with his desires. And so we're going to lock him up. I don't know if you read the story, uh, The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas by Ursula K. Le Quinn. It's a fantastic short story about a utopia where the utopia is held up by taking someone of lower stature and making them suffer for the good of the many. Just like how the golden rule is the sin of the one becomes the punishment of the many, in this case, the suffering of the one justifies the flourishing of the many. Dooley is that character. He's just sitting there and he's confused. He doesn't quite understand why he's trapped and confusion is a kind of suffering. And you're talking to him and like he doesn't really quite know what's going on. Please. Here. It makes me very sad. It seems like the cruelest thing to do that to someone, to put them in a place where they can't even understand what they did wrong, and yet everyone on the outside of the prison is justified and is the good ones in that case. There's this idea that the difference between a utopia and a dystopia is that in a dystopia you can imagine that the government is at fault, and in a utopia you simply can't. They're basically the same thing, just the utopia is the idea that, well, it's not the government's fault. If, if anything goes wrong, it's the people's fault. They didn't follow the system. That's sort of how they view their place in this town. They think like, well, let's not worry about whether this is a, a just system or not. We know that it has power over us, so all we can do is blame each other. I don't remember anyone in the dialogue questioning whether the system itself is moral. Because there's the sin thing, but they don't then say, are the gods doing a sin by trapping us in this situation? Yeah, they seem to actively want to steer away from any of that kind of talk. Because in a way, it's, it's just impractical. It doesn't accomplish anything for them to think that they are being stifled by an unfair system, right? That They still have to live under it anyway, so they would rather not think about those things. And so as a result, I mean, the game doesn't end up really being about, until the very end, about questioning that system, right? It's really just about helping people within the system. It's about doing whatever you can, given these bizarre rules, to help as many people as you can. Only at the end can you discover what's actually going on, what the source of these problems is, and, and only then can you really confront them as ideas. We should talk about some spoilers now. If you want to avoid spoilers, skip to the time that I'm going to put on screen. If you go through the work of helping every single person in this town, you will eventually discover that you're all dead. Turns out when you listen to people's stories, you find that they all have a similar starting point where they're on a river and they meet a stranger and they have a coin and this leads to them entering the space. That stranger that you all met is the ferryman Charon or Charon and the coin is this special one of 1000 coins that takes you across the river Styx to go to the underworld. This whole system that's in place is a kind of test being done by Pluto or Hades or whatever name you want to call him, the leader of the underworld. And he just wants to see if it's possible for humans to live without sin for one full year. And he wants to do that because he made a bet with some other god in order to take the god's daughter, Proserpina, with him to Elysium. So you're all just playthings for this Hades figure, for this Pluto figure. And you get to talk to him. And that's like this whole thing where you just get to sort of argue with him back and forth. It's a very flashy and extreme kind of end where suddenly all of the wallpaper gets ripped off. You are literally entering the domain of a god and it's made of light and it's it just looks it's sort of futuristic and impossibly old at the same time. It looks really cool and it just feels like a culmination of all the ideas in the game because you can finally confront the source of all these punishments and hold that being accountable too under the same logic and say, well, you know, aren't you sinning by creating this system? So you get to kind of debate him. And of course you can't debate him with perhaps every argument you can think of personally. There was at least a good enough spectrum of ideas that you can throw at him. You also allow him to explain himself. Although there is a flaw at the foundation of a lot of his thinking, there is something to understand about his thinking. He takes a very literal view of the rule. And that's where a lot of the potential sins, you know, the conning people and kidnapping people and all the things that seem like they should be sins that people get away with. He explains why from his point of view that doesn't count. 
it sort of shows the nature of rules and how they have to be nonsensical to an extent in actual real world conditions because the very nature of rules is general and the very nature of reality is specific and when you have the general and the specific butt heads it's going to feel absurd that's essentially what he captures in his dialogue with you is the absurdity of applying something so across the board so simplified to specific scenarios that are otherwise so complex and it's that contrast that really becomes like the essence of the disagreement and the argument that you have i kind of wish that whole section went even longer I kind of wish that I could have literally debated him on every point, but they don't give you that satisfaction. Part of that is the character of the Pluto guy. Turns out that the way to win him over is not to show the contradiction and to show that he's wrong because he ends up becoming just bitter and deciding, okay, well then you just want to die. It turns out that the best way to sway him is to appeal to his sense of superiority, to appeal to the reasoning that he values in himself, and to suggest to him that he was potentially tricked by agreeing to this deal in the first place. And that allows him an excuse to be able to actually disavow his own ideas because then it becomes someone else's ideas. It's such a great little touch. It's like people don't just run on logic. They, there's so much emotion built into the logic. Often the logic is rationalized after the fact, post hoc from the emotion. And so that's what you kind of get a taste of with him. If you actually argue with him purely logically, you'll lose. You have to bring in that emotional ego that's there. Mm -hmm. I thought that was clever. And again, it touches on the developer being a lawyer or having been a lawyer. Like he understands the ways in which humans are more flimsy with their arguments than it otherwise superficially appears. Well, that moment kind of works as, as a way of humanizing this God figure, right? Because he, he, he has those same uh, motivations. He's still like a sentient being with his own sort of ego. You can question him really on that basis, because like if, if you were to just try to say that his, his ideas are illogical, he could he could move the goalposts as long as he wants, right? He, he could always come up with a rationalization for why it all makes perfect sense to him. You have to kind of put things into a larger context of like, well, what do you have to gain? What does what do these other gods have to gain? Like what is actually happening here? It's only when you make him feel a little smaller that you can get him to kind of open his eyes and realize what he's doing. And ultimately, the whole game revolves around the nature of goalposts moving. Because you at some point learn you get to go underground and you find out that this town has been happening for millennia again and again but it's been covering different cultures, right? It started with the Sumerians and they have their version of the underworld god. And then it moved on to the Egyptians and everything was renamed and the Egyptians took over. And that's a different concept of sin and a different concept of how to organize society. And then that gets taken over by the Greeks and they have a different view of sin and how to organize society. And then that gets taken over by the Romans and they have a different view. And there's this suggestion that like these hard and fast rules which in any one society or time feel completely definite and determined are actually quite rudimentarily subjective and actually quite contingent on factors that are temporary. The clinging to the permanence of it is so ironically the most temporary thing about it because that permanent quality is really what changes the most in these rules and in this logic and like when you talk to the underworld guy like that's what you get is like him moving goalposts but like the whole culture is doing that. Everyone's doing that with morality with rules. It's such a fun idea to play with. I like that there's a game that's trying to do that. If you're interested in this game, it is pretty much just a classic detective story with some moral conundrums teased here and there. But mostly it's just talking to people, learning about their stories, people really going through a hard time and you just helping them. And that is the bulk of the game. The fact that it's a game about ideas in a small space that also gets to teach you a little bit of history at the same time means that of the many different independent games that could arise, it is one of the most unique. It's a short experience, it's, you're, it's not going to be a 50 hour game. You could probably finish it really quickly by accident, depending on where you stumble. All in all, it's a heartfelt game from someone who clearly cares about storytelling and just wants to think about characters and the reality of trying to organize society around rules. And that reality is not quite so clean cut as we'd like to believe. <laughs>